Good morning and welcome to the March 21st, 2021 Tapestry Worship Gathering. Today we are at the Rose House, even though I'm filming by the Wisconsin River. Oh, what a wonderful day. I mean, the weather is amazing. How awesome is this? It's spring in Wisconsin until the cold weather happens again, but right now it's pretty awesome. So, but today, as in IE Sunday, March 21st, we are at the Rose House, which we will continue doing every other week worship, or in person worship gatherings there for the near future. And what I mean by the near future is we want to make sure that this is working for everyone. So through April, we're going to continue every other week, which means we're there this week. We're not there next week, and it'll be by video. And then we're there the week after, which is Easter. And we'll be in person, and there'll be a video. And uh, that video will go out to everyone. Uh, and the live message will go out to everyone. We think we've got that completely figured out now. We will continue that through April, unless something changes. If something changes dramatically good, then we'll just start in-person ga gatherings every week. Uh, if something were to change really bad, then we would not go to every week. But right now, the plan is May 1st, every week we will be at the Rose House. We'll still do a video, and uh, uh, the, the live message will still be sent out by video. So keep that in mind. I want to make sure everyone feels comfortable with what we're doing. So there's a survey this week. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking that, it lets me know how you're doing and lets me know what your thoughts are on things. Please remember, we are going to make sure everyone is safe as far as we possibly can, okay? So there is no pressure for you to come. I mean, I would love for you to be there. I'd love to see your face, but there is no pressure for you to come. You're st is still very much part of the church, and everything we do will be sent out to everyone as far as we possibly can, such as last week we had a live message, not last week, week before last, we had a live message and uh, the audio messed up. So you got to, to see my lovely face talking, but you didn't get to hear what was being said. So please fill out the survey. Helps me to know things on that. Uh, Easter's coming up. We will be at the Rose House. Otherwise, take care of one another. It's the way we glorify God is by taking care of one another because when we do that, we recognize what He's done for us. We recognize that we see Him in each other because we each bear his image and we recognize that we're following his son who was the one who was the friend of the lowly. So take care of one another. Reach out. I think that's it. Oh, other than when we start meeting together again. We've got a lot of babies in the church right now. Uh, the statistics I've heard is actually there's been a baby bust during the pandemic, but in tapestry apparently that's the exact opposite. Uh, We've got a lot of babies, and right now that doesn't mean much other than we have cute babies around. It does mean about six months to a year from now, our nursery is going to get significantly bigger. <laughs> um, and if you've ever had to chase around an 18-month-old, you know it takes a lot of hands. So please be in prayer about joining our nursery. <laughs> we could really use you. You get to play with kids. It's a pretty awesome thing. Um, if you're interested, talk to me or talk to somebody on the leadership team. We'll take you through a background check because we just always want to make sure our kids are as safe as possible. And uh, there, that's it. So if you would join me in prayer, we will begin to worship the Lord together. Father, thank you for this gorgeous day and for, for spring in Wisconsin. It is just such a great reminder uh, that your life defeats death. The winter can be harsh. The winter can be lonely. And then... Spring begins to happen and everyone goes outside and we see one another again. Life defeats death. Father, that is what you do. Help us to remember that. Help us to be reminded this week as we experience the beginning of spring. And help us to be reminded that you do that constantly, not just in spring overcoming winter, but in our lives where you take things that are dead and you make them alive again. You are the God of the resurrection and the life. I pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Guys, let's begin to worship the Lord and declare how worthy he is.
Psalm 51, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Do you think life can come from death? Absolutely. I think uh, in some ways that's what Jesus does say, right, is the seed has to be buried in the ground in order to yield fruit. And, and there are things in each of us uh, and in each of our communities and churches that do need to die in order for, for a different life to be, to be brought to light. Um, we, you know, we need to die to our own pretensions and our own, um, our own uh, choice to, to be somebody, uh, to become stars or become powerful or become whatever. And it's not that God doesn't want us to, 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 to choose to grow, but it's who do we grow for? <laughs> Uh, what's the point of having more, um, a higher position? Is it just to benefit ourselves or the little circle around us? Or does it have to do with living out more fully the values of God's kingdom and ensuring that more people can experience the fullness of life that Jesus promises? What do you need to die to? Personally, I think one of the things I always have to struggle with is my... Um, I tend to be very organized and to want to have everything under control. Um, I want to be able to uh, determine um, when and what I do. And uh, it's been a, a tough uh, shakeup in life in which I've had to recognize that actually I live by grace. I cannot, I cannot construct my future or that of my children and the people I care about or even the big future of the world. I'm no messiah. Um, and so I just have to die to my illusions of control and salvation. And, you know, I'm going to do it because I care so much. I need to let God be God and do God's work and, and just humbly uh, try to make myself available as Mary did to say you do do what you want with me through me um, in me um, so that's that's probably my uh, and there probably there are tons more not of all not all of them will I want to admit good morning everybody I will be reading to you from Hebrews chapter 5 verses 5 through 10 in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. 
And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name and Christ alone. So we're in the fifth week or the fifth Sunday of Lent and today's passage is from the 12th chapter of the Gospel according to John. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to read with me. Let me start off though beforehand by saying this is the emergency message. It is my fervent hope that none of you see this, okay? If you see this, it either means that um, our video didn't work for the message and we're doing the emergency message for everybody who's not at the Rose House, or you clicked on the wrong link, and that probably means I sent it to you in a bad way in some way. Uh, hopefully, there's a live message. The live message is always better because of the fact that uh, your fellow threads are contributing to that, and uh, God really speaks through your fellow threads. So I'm hoping you are not watching this. That would make me really happy. <laughs> this is just practice for tomorrow. That's what I'm hoping. So, if you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, we're going to be reading verses 20 through 33. This is what the Word of the Lord says. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was born in Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew and Philip then in turn told Jesus. 
Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Not the prince, uh, now the prince of this world will be driven out. Uh, and then when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So I've been a minister for a long time. I, I'm 53 now. I, uh, I started as a youth minister when I was 20. One. And other than two years I've been in a church, uh, actually three years, let me change that, <laughs> um, in a church as a minister in one fashion or another. And I've worked with just some absolutely incredible ministers, just people that are, are giants in the land. And I don't mean giants in the sense that they are important people, you wouldn't know who the vast majority of them are, 99%. I mean giants in faithfulness. And I want to tell you, well, I want to tell you about one of my favorites who passed away this past week. His name's Paul Swadley. Most of you have no earthly idea who he is. Um, there are a few of you who do. We have a few people from uh, the, the third church I worked at uh, in Carthage, Missouri who know who Paul Swadley was. And, and they know who Paul Swadley was because of the fact that, well, he was the interim pastor at the church that I was youth minister at for a while. And so if you weren't raised in the church world, you may never have heard the term um, interim pastor. Matter of fact, if Tapestry is your first church, you don't know what an interim pastor is most likely. But you can guess, okay? It's the pastor who's there in the interim. It's when you lose one pastor, and you're trying to get another pastor, the interim's the one who comes in there and preaches and offers guidance during this short time period or long time period in between pastors. It's typically a re retired pastor, and uh, Paul Swadley was our interim pastor at First Baptist Carthage, Missouri, and uh, he was there for not quite a year. And like I said, he's not anybody famous, you would never know of him, though he, he did baptize Brad Pitt. <laughs> Uh, Brad Pitt and uh, Paul Swadley's son, John Swadley, were best friends in high school. And so Paul Swadley's claim to fame for most people would be he baptized Brad Pitt. I don't know if that means he's a good baptizer or a bad baptizer, but he did baptize Brad Pitt. What I know about him is we loved him. I mean, just loved him. He, he's one of my top favorite pastors to ever work with. Just loved him. And the other thing is, is that, well, he would start his sermon, and quite often about a third to a halfway through the sermon, well, you don't know this, but he had memory issues because of his age and some, some, some brain stuff that was going on. And so quite often a third of the way through to a half of the way through, he'd forget what he was preaching and would go back to some other sermon. And quite often, and like I remember one time he literally preached halfway through, he went back to the sermon he had preached the week before. He would often say that he couldn't remember what he preached last week, but he could remember what he preached 20 years ago. The same thing would happen when you would ask him questions sometimes. He would start down one path and, and then forget what he was answering and go down another path. And the thing about it is, he would almost invariably always come back to a story about him being kicked in the head by a mule when he was a kid. And he would say that's why he forgot things was uh, because of that mule kicking him in the head. I, I almost feel like um, Swad, as he was called quite often, uh, just had in his mind, uh, mind this thought of when in doubt, when you forget what you're saying, just go to the mule story. The mule story kills. Tell it. And he was right, because the mule story did kill. And 
almost every time that he started preaching one sermon and then ending up at another sermon, or he started answering one question and then ending up at another question, well, he quite often didn't answer the question I asked or preach the sermon that I thought he was going to, but he almost always answered the question I needed asked. He answered the question that I, I wasn't smart enough to ask that he somehow just knew I needed. He preached the sermon that I needed even though he, he didn't start down that path. And, and this is, it's one of the reasons I love Swadley, but it's one of the things that Jesus does. I think Paul Swadley was following in Jesus' life because again and again, Jesus has asked one question, Jesus, go down this path. And instead he goes down this way. And he answers the question that we don't even know to ask. He answers the question we need rather than the one we want an answer for. That's what's happening here, okay? Look again at the beginning of this passage. This is what it says at the very beginning. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. This whole passage starts from, can the Greeks see Jesus? And Philip doesn't know the answer. Okay, they come to Philip because they're, they're concerned to come to Jesus, okay? As a, a good Jew, as a, a faithful and righteous, righteous Jew, it is well within their expectations that Jesus is not going to want to see them. Josephus, if you know who he was, he was an ancient Near Eastern historian who's a Jewish historian, and he specifically says, here's a quote, Jews did not come into contact with other people because of their separateness. Now, we've talked about the word holy before, and holy means, means pure in the sense of no sin, but it also means pure in the sense of separate and other than. And one of the ways the Jews lived in the ancient Near East was they, they lived in a manner that made them separate from everyone else. And so the Greeks had every reason to think Jesus is a good, holy Jew. He will not be with us. And Philip had every reason to think that maybe Jesus was still kind of living that out. Now, not from Jesus' character. Jesus uh, brought everyone in who wanted to. But when they began their ministry, Jesus specifically told them to go to the Jews, not to the Gentiles at this point. Here's, here's what Jesus says on this. He says, uh, well, the passage says, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. This is what Jesus told them. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. At one point, Jesus had told his disciples, go to Israel. That's where we're focused right now. Now, Jesus was going to spread the gospel to everyone, but he was going to start with the Jews. So Philip had every reason to believe this could be a problem. That's why Andrew didn't know either. So they come to Jesus with the question, can the Greeks see you? Jesus we know you well enough to know that you care for all people, but we also know you well enough to know that you are righteous and holy. Can the Greeks see you? And Jesus, he answers the question they need answered, not the question they ask. You read this passage. It doesn't say yes or no to, to uh, the Greeks coming to see him. It doesn't talk about him at all anymore. Jesus doesn't say, yes, let's take care of this administrative need. Instead, he focuses on something else. Here's, here's what Jesus begins to say at this point. He says, uh, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus begins to take their question about whether or not the Greeks can see him, and he turns it into a, you must die to yourself. I like the word ego here. 
So much of our lives is, is shaped around these identities that we think are who we are, but instead are things that we are trying to shape to impress someone else, or we believe we have to fit into because of the culture. They're not really who we are. We just pick all of these things. Matter of fact, it's like you really spend the first 30 to 40 years of your life just trying to figure out who you are, and all of it's just this fake junk. We we bear images up that make people, well, make us think that people will like us or not that will make it look like we are somebody. And that, that ego there just drives our lives. It, it begins to control us in the sense of how we, we want to protect ourselves and protect those who belong with us and, and how we exclude certain people. If I am this type of person, I must exclude that type of purpose, person. We break into this tribalism because of the fact that our ego is determined by who we are with and who likes us. And, and Jesus says that if you like, love that life and you want to cling to it, you're going to die. Our egos, they destroy us. And yet, when our ego falls to the ground and like a seed dies, real life comes out of it. That really is the rule of the kingdom, okay? Life comes out of death. Our life comes out of Jesus' death and then Jesus calls us into that death and then new life greater and better comes out of it. Philip and Andrew came asking a question about whether or not the Greeks could see him because they were used to a world in which your righteousness was determined by who you hung out with and what you ate, by how pure you are. And Jesus is bringing a life that determines your holiness based off who you belong to. Are you, are you his? Are you with him? Are you where he is? When we allow that to die, it changes everything. Now, I don't mean by that that we kill it off. We can't, okay? We are such egotistical people. We can't even do it ourselves. But we can learn to hate that which, which we know is not of Him. And we can beg and plead for Him to be the one to transform us because that's what He does. He is the one who transforms us. When He transforms us, we suddenly find ourselves being drawn to where he is. Where is he? Well, he's in the areas of love. Even with people that, that he disagrees with, he's still treating them with love. He's in the areas of peace, and I don't mean by that a lack of conf uh, conflict. I mean by that areas of wholeness and tranquility. Tranquility that comes from knowing whose you are and not pretending to be what you're not. See, those are statements that come from saying, Jesus, I give you my life. I am dead to myself. Do with me as you will. I believe that when we give our lives to Him, we're just drawn to the areas He's drawn to. And Jesus is a friend of of sinners. So what the Pharisees said about him, that they, they said it as though it was some type of, of negative thing against him, and instead the church took it and it became a title for Jesus. It's one of the titles that we give to him, Jesus, friend of sinners. It's what the church does so well, truthfully. It's what Jesus does so well. That which is meant for harm instead is turned to good. Jesus is that friend of sinners, and I think He calls us to be where He is, to be able to sit comfortably with ourselves knowing our own failures, to be able to sit comfortably with others in the midst of their own failures. I believe when that happens, God is glorified. I mean, Jesus talks about this glory in, in the midst of the suffering that's coming. He recognizes that the end is near for Him. And the reason he recognizes that is actually literally the Greeks coming to see him because one of the things that's going to happen is when the Son of Man is lifted up, all people will be drawn to him. So the Greeks coming to seek him out becomes a sign of the fact that his, his time is almost over. And our Lord 
being the whole complete person of shalom that he is doesn't deny the fact that he's not excited about this. But what he says is, this is the very reason I came here. I don't want to do this. I'm tempted to ask the Father to make it not happen. But this is the reason that I've come here. And through his suffering, the Father will be glorified. Through his death bringing about life, God will be glorified. See, I, I fear that sometimes when we go to church, we're, well, what we need to hear is we need to hear the God of grace. The God who looks at us and says, I love you. And so often what we do instead is we go there looking for, for answers that don't, don't provide that. Maybe they provide judgment. We may feel worse after leaving church. What I hope you hear every week is that when you, you are in tapestry, you leave going, I have a God who loves me. I may not get it right all the time, but I have a God who loves me. And you allow that love to transform you, to become a little more like who you're supposed to be. Something you can't do on your own, something I can't do on my own, but something that He does in us. That when we die to ourselves, to our own ego, the flesh, as, as Paul calls it, okay? And, and he uses that word, flesh, and, and it's, it's, it's a good word. My only problem with it is sometimes we think it means our bodies, and he's talking more about our sinful natures, our egos, <laughs> our focus on me, <laughs> me, myself, and I. Um, and when we let that flesh die, we really get new life. And God is glorified by that. You were loved. You were wanted. You were forgiven. Let God be glorified by that. He has before. He will be again. Would you join me in prayer, please? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let that ego die. Let it fall to the ground. And God cause life to spring up. That's what He does. Have a great week, okay?